on World News Tonight. A new era. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. sworn in as Philippines president after 36 years of his own father being ousted from power from public revolt. NATO doubles down. Sweden and Finland are set to join NATO as the member countries take aim at Russia as its main enemy. Recession calls. Consumers in the United Kingdom are moving to credit alternatives to meet basic needs, with the US S&P 500 index reaching lows not seen in 50 years. And an escape from COVID. Shanghai opens up its Disneyland after quite a few stressful months of lockdown. Welcome to World News Tonight. Thank you for joining us. A lot to report to you and we're going to start from our neighbours in Asia, specifically the Philippines. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has been sworn in as the Philippine president in a ceremony in Manila, succeeding the outgoing leader Rodrigo Duterte. His inauguration marks a stunning comeback for the Marcos political dynasty which was ousted after a popular revolt in 1986. Sara Duterte, the daughter of the outgoing president, is being sworn in as vice president. In his first speech as president, he thanked the crowd for delivering what he described as the biggest electoral mandate in the history of Philippine democracy. The 64-year-old leader is inheriting a country still on the road to recovery from a years-long pandemic and an economic outlook clouded by skyrocketing inflation and rising debt. Over to more leading news, Russian President Vladimir Putin has condemned NATO's imperial ambitions accusing the military alliance of seeking to assert its supremacy through the Ukraine conflict. President Putin made his comment a day after NATO member Turkey lifted its veto over the bid by Finland and Sweden to join the alliance, when the three nations agreed to protect each other's security. NATO invited Sweden and Finland to join the military alliance on Wednesday in one of the biggest shifts in European security in decades. The traditionally neutral Nordic countries made their bids to join following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. NATO also formally agreed to treat Russia as the most significant and direct threat to the Allies' security, according to a summit statement. President Joe Biden said the US-led alliance would be ready to deal with threats from all directions. We're going to approve a new NATO strategic concept and uh, reaffirm the unity and determination of our alliance to defend every inch of NATO territory. And uh, Article 5 is sacrosanct, and we mean it when we say an attack against one is an attack against all, every inch. He also said the U.S. would ramp up forces in Europe in response to threats from Russia. Biden's pledge came as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky appeared at the summit virtually to appeal for more weapons. The question is, who will be next for Russia? Moldova or the Baltic countries or Poland? The answer is all of them. The bloc's 30 allies took the decision to admit Sweden and Finland at their summit in Madrid. Ratification in allied parliaments is likely to take up to a year. But once it's done, Finland and Sweden will be covered by NATO's Article 5 Collective Defence Clause, putting them under the United States' protective nuclear umbrella. And Initially, Turkey vetoed the Nordic countries' bids to join due to concerns about terrorism. But President Tayyip Erdogan gave them the green light on Tuesday evening after agreeing to a series of security measures with his Finnish and Swedish counterparts. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization was founded in 1949 to defend against the Soviet threat. Russia's February 24th invasion of Ukraine, which it calls a special operation, gave the organization a new impetus after failures in Afghanistan and internal discord during the era of former U.S. President Donald Trump. More news from Europe. Italy, which is facing one of the worst droughts in its history, is now being plagued with the unfortunate situation of seawater flowing into the country's longest river, Po, hampering irrigation. As Italy experiences its worst drought in decades, dried out crops aren't the only threat to farmers. Salt water from the Adriatic Sea is now flowing back into the Po, the country's longest river. 
The flow of seawater into the Po makes irrigation almost impossible, as it risks burning the already parched crops. Giancarlo Montavani is the director of Reclaiming the Po, who are fighting to protect the river. If there is no rain in the next 10 or 15 days, the crops that are not yet lost will be gone. At this stage, we are progressively losing the harvest. The longer the situation lasts, the worse the problem gets, and the more sown areas fail to produce. The Po runs for more than 403 miles from west to east, across the north of the country, a region which accounts for around a third of the country's agricultural output. The river is suffering the effects of a lack of winter snow, compounded by a baking early summer. Large areas of sandbanks lay exposed on stretches of the river as the water levels drop and its flow slows, making it easier for seawater to encroach. These fields in Porta Tolle, near the Po Delta, once contained an abundance of soy plants. Now they are dried up and damaged. Federica Vidali works here as an agricultural entrepreneur. She says the lack of rain is starting to concern her. I am trying to be optimistic, but at the moment when it doesn't rain and you see the whole year of work lost, you become afraid, you are sad and you try to be positive. As part of efforts for some respite from the crisis, tractors have been set up to pump water from River Po into canals in Isola Pescorali, a small town in the province of Cremona, which can then water the crops. But in recent weeks, the water levels dropped so drastically that the water lifting system was blocked. And it's not just the Po which is suffering. Italy's northern lakes are already below or close to record lows and the level of natural reservoirs in the centre of the country are also plunging. A French court handed a life sentence to the lone survivor of the Islamist squad that killed 130 people in the night of carnage across Paris in 2015. 19 other men judged for helping organise the November 13, 2015 attacks that targeted the Bataclan Music Hall, six bars and restaurants, and the Stade de France Sports Stadium were also found guilty. A French court on Wednesday sentenced the primary suspect in the brutal 2015 Paris terror attacks to life imprisonment with no possibility of early release, a sentence handed down only four times before in the country. Belgian-born Salah Abdeslam was found guilty on terrorism and murder charges, the judge said. The 32-year-old is believed to be the only surviving member of the group that carried out the November 13, 2015 gun and bomb rampage on the Bataclan Concert Hall, six bars and restaurants, and a sports stadium that left 130 people dead. Abdislam said at the start of the trial that he was a, quote, soldier of Islamic State, which has claimed responsibility for the attacks. He's one of 20 people sentenced Wednesday in connection with the attack. 13 others in the courtroom were accused of crimes ranging from helping provide the attackers with weapons or cars to planning to take part in the attack. Six more were tried in absentia. Abdeslam said during the trial he had chosen at the last minute not to detonate his explosive vest. The court concluded that, in fact, the vest malfunctioned. It has been a trial like no others, not only for its exceptional length of 10 months, but also for the time it devoted to allowing victims to testify in detail, while families of those killed spoke of how hard it was to move on. Over the U.S., abortion trigger laws in the United States have built a legal dilemma in state courts, given the days following the ruling on Roe v. Wade. Trigger laws are specific laws that are bound to change in the event of a change in circumstance. Some states now have an issue as to whether abortion is completely illegal or not. The battle over Kentucky's abortion trigger law moving to a courtroom today. Your Honor, there is a real vagueness problem here with the trigger bin. Kentucky, one of 12 states where the future of abortion services is now in court, causing confusion for patients, doctors and lawmakers alike. I don't think it could get more confusing. Um, Dr. Gabrielle Goodrick leads Arizona's Camelback Family Planning Clinic, performing abortions until Friday. 
Now its website says it's temporarily suspended elective abortions, unsure what's legal. There are two abortion laws on Arizona's books. One signed this March, which bans abortion after 15 weeks, but does not repeal the second, more restrictive law. That one enacted when Arizona was just a territory, bans all abortions unless the mother's life is in danger. Abortion rights opponents argue for the older law. Arizona does not have two laws on abortion. It has one law that prohibits abortion except to save the life of the mother. It's not confusing. But a county judge blocked that ban in 1973, leaving some to wonder where that law stands. And now the confusion expanding to emergency contraception. A Missouri health system stopped providing emergency contraception after that state banned abortion. St. Luke's health system concerned its clinicians could be in legal jeopardy. Tonight, it reversed course, providing the pills again, but saying the ambiguity of the law continues to cause grave concern. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. U.S. federal authorities had announced that they had charged four men with human smuggling in the deaths of 53 Central American migrants who were found in a sweltering tractor trailer in southwest San Antonio Monday this week. Here is the latest in what is considered to be the single biggest human smuggling case in U.S. history. Tonight, stunning new evidence in what officials are calling the nation's deadliest case of human smuggling. This empty trailer now tied to the deaths of 53 men, women, and potentially children left packed inside. Among the dead, four Hondurans, including two brothers, Alejandro and Fernando Caballero. Today, their mother mourning their loss, saying her sons were anxious but excited for a future where they could work to build their mom a new home. Mexican authorities cooperating with U.S. investigators are painting a grim picture of the deadly journey. After crossing the border in Laredo, Mexican officials say at 2.45 p.m. Monday, the truck passed through a Border Patrol checkpoint in Encino, Texas. A camera capturing the driver, identified by Mexican authorities as a now-detained U.S. citizen, who then drove through Catula, before stopping 146 miles later in San Antonio on a 100-degree day. That alleged driver, named by the U.S. Justice Department as Omero Zamorano, and charged tonight with one count of alien smuggling resulting in death. If convicted, Zamorano faces up to life in prison or a possible death sentence. It's a lot of coordination, so it's suggestive of a higher level organization. On the border, Governor Greg Abbott promising additional checkpoints. Today, alongside the remote road where so many lives were lost, a somber memorial marked by flowers and bottles of water for those no longer here. Over to news on the economy around the world, the S&P 500 ended a seesaw session slightly down from yesterday as investors staggered toward the finish line of a downbeat month, a dismal quarter and the worst first half for Wall Street's benchmark index since 1970. U.S. stocks spent much of Wednesday wavering between red and green only to finish barely changed as investors limped toward the finish line of a downbeat month, a dismal quarter, and the worst half of the year for the S&P 500 since President Richard Nixon's first term in office. The Dow posted a gain of about a quarter of a percent. The S&P 500 ended down fractionally, while the Nasdaq finished about flat. Brian Vendig, president of MJP Wealth Advisors, said investors are likely waiting for personal consumption expenditures data on Thursday to see if inflation has eased. I think the U.S. stock market today, again, is uh, looking ahead at the expected uh, PCE indicators uh, tomorrow on inflation um, and also a uh, little bit of um, choppiness due to uh, changes in commodity prices uh, around oil. So right now, you know, the market is, is staying within a range, I think, until we get a little bit more of a consensus view on where inflation is going uh, over the next couple of weeks. Market leaders Apple, Amazon, and Microsoft posted gains, providing some upside muscle to the S&P 500. Chipmakers led the declines, with Micron and AMD each falling more than 3 percent after Bank of America cut its price targets on several chip stocks. Shares of General Mills jumped after the packaged food company said its sales beat estimates. 
and Bed Bath & Beyond sank more than 23.5% after the retailer announced that it replaced its CEO, hoping to reverse a dismal sales slump. Or the United Kingdom, with recent inflationary effects on the United Kingdom's consumer markets, people are forced to go without essentials or move into an extensive debt. Over 1.3 million households have been forced to use credit to meet basic needs such as food. Kerry is struggling to find a way out of her spiralling debt. She owes £20,000 and counting. I'm paying it bit by bit. I don't know. I'll probably be dead before it finishes. So, well, what can I do? Kerry works two days a week as a healthcare assistant, but even with universal credit, can't get by. It's all too much. I'm not a lazy person. I work very hard. It's tough. It's very tough. Yeah. These days, food banks are offering more than just something to eat, as increasingly people come to them with money worries. This one in the London borough of Kingston is run by the Trussell Trust, which has revealed the most common form of debt now is to the government. Almost half of the people they support have deductions for things like council tax arrears taken from their benefits. They think they're managing, but as interest rates go up, as costs of food and costs of living go up, I think we're going to find debt just becomes more and more of, a, of an issue. The charity, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, surveyed low-income households. That's those in the bottom 40%. It found 4.6 million are behind on at least one bill. In seven months, personal borrowing has more than doubled. And 1.3 million households have used credit to cover essentials such as food. This pawnbrokers, which only takes luxury items, told us they've seen an upturn in people trying to raise cash, selling whatever they can. We certainly are seeing more inquiries come through from our website and emails for people inquiring whether we would offer a loan against electronic items or uh, mobile phones predominantly, because I think that's something a lot of people do have to hand. Right, pop that in. The government says it's put in place a package of support to help with rising costs, but more and more people face a future owing money they don't have. Over to Asia, South Korea's economy showed some growth in May thanks to stronger industrial output and corporate investment. However, consumer spending declined again, dropping for the third month in a row. South Korea's overall industrial output in May rebounded from April thanks to the service industry. Data from Statistics Korea on Thursday shows that the country's industrial production index in May reached 117.1, up 0.8 percent from April. It was led by an increase in service industry output, which rebounded with a growth of 1.1 percent a month. The sports and leisure industry output also saw a growth of 6.5 percent. The agency says these figures come as COVID-19 restrictions were eased. During the same period, production in the construction industry saw a hike of 5.9 percent. Along with over-industry output, corporate investments in equipment jumped 13 percent, which also contributed to the recovery. As service industry output continued to be strong, overall industrial production shifted to an increase. Domestic spending has improved along with corporate investments. This has led to an overall economic recovery. However, retail sales, a barometer for consumer spending, fell slightly by 0.1 percent a month. This was mainly due to lower demand for semi-durable goods like clothing and entertainment and in sports goods, which dropped by 1.2 percent. Statistics Korea says economic uncertainties remain amid the ongoing Ukraine crisis and the monetary tightening across the globe. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. U.S. singer R. Kelly has been sentenced to 30 years in prison for using his celebrity status to sexually abuse children and women. Lawyers for the singer, whose real name is Robert Sylvester Kelly, says he will appeal. 
Ahead of his sentencing, a handful of women took the stand to confront Kelly. U.S. District Judge Ann Donnelly said the celebrity had used sex as a weapon, forcing his victims to do unspeakable things and saddling some with sexually transmitted diseases. Hundreds of Blue March protesters gathered outside the UN Ocean Conference taking place in Lisbon, where about 7,000 people are assessing progress in implementing a UN directive to protect marine life. There is growing interest in deep sea mining, which would involve using heavy machinery to suck up off the ocean floor rocks or nodules that contain cobalt, manganese and other rare metals mostly used in batteries. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. If you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with the joyful sights of the reopening of Shanghai's Disneyland after three months of closure due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Visitors stream through the gates at the opening time, eager to get on the rides and soak up the atmosphere. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.